The Law of Self-Defense content you are about to enjoy is presented for general educational purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice. If you are in need of legal advice, consult competent legal counsel in the relevant jurisdiction. Welcome to our ongoing coverage of the Minnesota murder trial of Derek Chauvin over the in-custody death of George Floyd. I am attorney Andrew Branca for Law of Self-Defense, providing guest commentary and analysis of this trial for legal insurrection. Also, as a reminder, I am live parlouring the trial in real time over at my Parlor account, which you can find using my Parlor handle at Law of Self Defense, no spaces at Law of Self Defense. This afternoon, the prosecution, meaning Assistant Attorney General Matthew Frank, and the defense, meaning Attorney Eric Nelson, worked through a bunch of evidentiary motions before trial Judge Peter Cashel. These motions are entirely routine in any criminal prosecution, and in a sense, they are part of defining the battlefield on which the legal fight will be won or lost at trial. In effect, these motions define what evidence and legal arguments will be permitted to be made at trial. The preference is to hash these issues out before the trial itself begins so that the trial proper, when the jurors are actively participating, can be seen as, can be as efficient as possible. Generally, these evidentiary motions are referred to as in limine motions, essentially meaning motions to limit what evidence will be permitted before the jury. For example, if a suspect was pulled over and illegal drugs were discovered in the car, but the discovery was a result of an unconstitutional search, the defense counsel would make an in limine motion to exclude the unjustly discovered drugs from being introduced as evidence at trial. In practice, these types of motions tend to be more broad-ranging than just excluding evidence, however. Today's motions in the Chauvin case, for example, touched on a wide variety of both evidentiary issues as well as simple matters of process and practice for the trial itself. One motion, motion number two, for example, addressed how most properly to refer to Chauvin, to Floyd, and others during the course of the trial. It's theoretically permissible to refer to Derek Chauvin throughout the trial as the defendant or the accused, and to refer to George Floyd throughout the trial as the victim or the deceased. In practice, however, such phrasing tends to be emotive and prejudicial, and many judges prefer to avoid such terminology. Fortunately for the defense, Judge Cashel is among those, and he expressed a strong preference for both the prosecution and defense to refer to the parties and witnesses by their actual names. So, Mr. Chauvin, rather than the defendant, and Mr. Floyd, rather than the victim, uh, rather than those legalistic labels. The state and defense agree to abide by the court's preference while noting that they have only incomplete control over how witnesses might phrase things. But of course, the judge can handle that in real time. Another motion, motion number one, dealt with the issue of whether a witness could be recalled to the stand if, after they initially testified, they had then viewed the testimony of other witnesses. It's normal practice to avoid having witnesses hear the testimony of other witnesses because doing so can color their own testimony. All witnesses, while waiting their turn to testify, are told to not listen to the testimony of earlier witnesses and are not permitted in the courtroom prior to their own testimony to prevent overhearing those other witnesses. But what about after a witness is done testifying? Well, if they're truly done and will not be called back into court to testify again, then there's no reason they shouldn't hear the testimony of other witnesses. But what if they only think they're done? What if everyone thinks they're done and they listen to such later witnesses and then discover that they're being called back to testify a second time unexpectedly? Here, in this case, the court stated its preference that a witness not be recalled if, after they themselves have testified, they later heard testimony of other witnesses. Basically, they're taken off the table. Most of the motions discussed this afternoon resulted in little argument between the state and prosecution, often no argument, whatever, but there were some exceptions. One such exception had to do with the admissibility of evidence about George Floyd having ingested illicit drugs upon arrest to the point of having to be hospitalized at an arrest event about a year prior to the one in which he died. 
The defense narrative of innocence in this case is obviously that what killed Floyd was not Chauvin's knee, but rather the threefold fatal dose of fentanyl found in Floyd's body upon medical examination. The belief is that when he, Floyd, realized he was about to be arrested for attempting to pass a bad $20 bill, Floyd ingested meth and fentanyl drugs he had on his person in order to prevent their discovery by the arresting officers. The dose ingested, unfortunately, for Floyd, for Chauvin, for all of Minneapolis, and for the United States generally, was more than sufficient to prove fatal. Almost exactly a year prior to the day Floyd died with a fatal dose of fentanyl in his body, he was also the subject of a lawful arrest and also apparently ingested illicit drugs to avoid their discovery by the arresting officers. In that case, Floyd received hospital care and did not die as a result of the drug ingestion. Now, naturally, with a nearly identical drug ingestion event having occurred with Floyd merely a year prior to his death, the defense would like to get evidence of that prior event in front of the jury. Their prior efforts to get that event admitted into evidence, however, had not gotten traction because the judge perceived the evidence as more prejudicial than probative. Uh, the term probative refers to the ability of a piece of evidence to make a claimed fact apparently more or less true. In effect, it's evidence that allows a finder of fact, usually a juror, to determine whether they believe a claimed fact to be true or false. An example might involve a case in which a defendant is accused of having stolen a watch owned by the victim. Upon arrest, the defendant is found wearing a watch that has the victim's initials engraved on the back, and those initials are not shared by the defendant. The defendant's defense is that the watch is actually his own property. He didn't steal it. The evidence of the victim's initials on the watch is probative to determining whether the watch is actually the property of the victim or of the defendant. The term prejudicial refers to evidence that's likely to unduly influence a finder of fact in an improper way. Prejudicial evidence is frequently of a type intended to suggest that because the accused committed some bad act in the past, that he has a propensity to commit the independent and unrelated bad act of which he is now accused. An example might involve a case in which a defendant is accused, say again, of having stolen a watch owned by the victim. Upon investigation, it's learned that five years prior, the defendant had been convicted of drunk driving. Although the drunk driving conviction is true, it's not relevant to the charge of theft, and if admitted into evidence might improperly lead the jury to conclude that the defendant is a quote-unquote bad person generally, and thus has a propensity to commit the crime of theft. That kind of evidence would not be admissible for that purpose. Often, some piece of offered evidence has some probative value as well as some prejudicial baggage, and it falls to the judge to balance the two in determining whether the evidence should be admitted before the jury. In drawing that balance, the judge looks both at the extent to which the offered evidence will help the finder of fact determine the truth of any element of the criminal charge or defense on the one hand, and the extent to which the evidence is simply prejudicial on the other. High probative value and low prejudicial tendency, and the evidence is likely admissible. Low probative value and high prejudicial tendency, and the evidence is likely inadmissible. In the matter of Floyd's 2019 drug ingestion event, Judge Cashel appears to feel rather strongly that the evidence of that event is far more prejudicial than probative. A large part of the limited probative value of that 2019 ingestion evidence, however, is really that it's largely duplicative of other evidence that's clearly admissible in this trial. The defense argued this afternoon that the evidence of the 2019 ingestion event ought to be admitted as proof of a modus operandi or method of operation in effect that this is what Floyd does when confronted by police. Now, modus operandi is an exception allowing for the admission of prior bad act evidence when the prior bad acts appear to be a consistent pattern or practice of behavior. So someone charged with, say, second-story burglary might not have a prior drunk driving conviction admitted as evidence at their trial for the burglary, but if they have prior convictions for second-story burglary in their record, those convictions might well be admissible as a pattern or practice of behavior in their trial for the newest charge of second-story burglary. 
Evidence of Floyd's drug ingestion as a modus operandi evidence would be helpful to the defense because, again, this ingestion really is the defense argument for the cause of Floyd's death rather than Floyd's death having been caused by Chauvin's knee. In making this argument before Judge Cashel this afternoon, however, defense counsel met a cool reception. Uh, I should mention that the defense had offered this evidence previously, and Judge Cashel had given a kind of blanket rejection at the time. But here the defense is re-offering the evidence of the prior ingestion on the grounds that they had additional details that they were lacking when they made the initial offer of evidence. Now, if the point of this prior ingestion event is to help the finder of fact, the jury, conclude that Floyd had ingested drugs on the day of his death as well, uh, then it really seems duplicative of other evidence in the case. After all, the medical examination of Floyd's body after his death found a threefold fatal dose of fentanyl in his system as well as meth. And all that's admissible in evidence, so the finder of fact can conclude that Floyd died of drug toxicity rather than of Chauvin's knee without the need for evidence of the prior drug ingestion event. And if the evidence of the prior drug ingestion event had little probative value in the context of other available evidence of Floyd's drug toxicity, it begins to look a lot like it's being submitted largely to show a propensity for bad conduct which is not a proper basis for the admission of evidence. So there's a general rule of evidence, termed 404B, that generally excludes prior bad acts or character evidence that's offered as proof of unrelated currently charged misconduct. So the relevant paragraph of 404 for our purposes is 404B, uh, and it reads, quote, evidence of another crime, wrong or act, is not admissible to prove the character of a person in order to show action in conformity therewith, that character, dot, dot, dot. As those ellipses suggest, however, there are, however, a number of exceptions to this exclusion of admissibility, like the modus operandi exception I already discussed above. It, that sentence continues from 404B, quote, it may, however, this would be, character evidence or prior bad acts evidence. It may, however, be admissible for other purposes, not to show a propensity, but as evidence of proof of motive, opportunity, intent, preparation, plan, knowledge, identity, or absence of mistake or accident. And by the way, we do link to the entirety of the Minnesota Court Rules of Evidence Rule 404 in the text version of today's content. Now, in the exchange between uh, defense counsel Eric Nelson and Judge Cashel on this motion to admit that prior arrest-related drug ingestion event, it's clear that the judge is having difficulty finding a 404B exception that would allow for the admission of that prior bad act of Floyd's 2019 arrest-related drug ingestion. And frankly, I thought defense counsel here didn't do a great job arguing for admissibility of this evidence. Um, Certainly, they should have been better prepared to argue more forcefully, given the prior cool treatment the argument had already received from Judge Cashel in the past. Now, Judge Cashel did note that evidence of the prior arrest-related drug ingestion event could be admissible for purposes other than, apparently, mere propensity. For example, if Chauvin had knowledge of or had participated in that prior arrest, that Knowledge might have informed Chauvin's own perceptions and conduct during the later arrest in which Floyd died, and that would be a basis for admissibility completely independent of Floyd's own propensity. The defense is not arguing, however, that Chauvin either had knowledge of nor participated in that prior arrest, so that basis for admissibility does not exist in this case. Alternatively, the door to this prior arrest-related ingestion event Evidence could be admissible if the prosecution opened the door by arguing that Floyd's drug levels were not the result of voluntary ingestion. If, for example, the state were to suggest that, well, perhaps Chauvin had forced the drugs into Floyd's mouth, then the defense could offer the evidence of the prior ingestion event to show the jury that it was likely that Floyd had, in fact, ingested the drugs himself. The state is not, however suggesting that the drugs got into Floyd's system in any manner other than by voluntary 
ingestion. If you're interested in hearing that roughly 10 minute long argument by the defense counsel, Eric Nelson, in favor of admitting that evidence of the prior arrest related drug ingestion by Floyd and Judge Cashel's rather cool response to that argument, I've got it for you right here. 34, Your Honor, um, is just our request to make an offer of proof. Uh, the court previously dealt with, obviously, the 404B motions that we brought relevant to the May of 2019 arrest of Mr. Floyd. Um, the court, in its order, it issued uh, sort of a summary order and had indicated that a memorandum would be filed by the court stating the reasons why certain 404Bs were admitted and others were rejected. We've just not received that order. What I expect, however, Your Honor, is, is that um, there has been um, significant developments in this regard, at least with respect to the defense perspective, um, that we would like to supplement our record, ultimately ask for reconsideration of based upon that new information that was not available at the time that we brought that motion. All right. Let's go ahead and do that now. Sure. Um, so, Your Honor, and again, I'm, I'm simply, um, I am speculating as to the court's rationale as to why uh, the previous arrest of Mr. Floyd was denied. However, I am, I am my speculation is that the court considered our analysis, our, our statement of facts to be somewhat speculative as to whether or not Mr. Floyd had drugs in his mouth at the time of his arrest. Um, since, uh, the court, since the court issued its order, um, the defense discovered uh, and went and inspected Squad 320 of the Minneapolis Police Department. Um, in reviewing photographs of Squad 320, there appeared to be white substances throughout the back seat of the squad car. Uh, so myself and some of the other defendants' attorneys and our investigators went to inspect Squad 320. Uh, it was very apparent that what was in Squad 320 was controlled substances. The state of Minnesota um, then subsequently uh, had those substances taken out of the squad car and tested. Uh, they are, in fact, methamphetamine and fentanyl, and they contain the DNA of George Floyd. Um, so they are chewed, partially chewed up uh, pills. In addition, Your Honor, the additional evidence that was discovered, uh, the state executed a second, uh, second search warrant on the Mercedes-Benz that was being driven by Mr. Floyd and located in the center council of those of the Mercedes Benz were two pills that were identical to the two pills that or appeared to be identical to the pills that were in squad 320. Those pills were analyzed and those pills also contained methamphetamine and fentanyl. So ultimately, if we look at this particular incident in what the state argued was speculative that our screenshots that we had submitted to the court in connection with that, that 404B, um, was it gum, was it something else, was it drugs? I think the question has been answered that we now know for a fact that there were drugs that were in the car. We know that there were drugs in the squad car that contained Mr. Floyd's DNA, and that those drugs in both of those cars were identical to the drugs that were in Mr. Floyd's system at the time of autopsy. So in that regard, Your Honor, if we liken it and we go back to what happened in May of 2019, when Mr. Floyd was pulled over, put a large amount of drugs in his mouth, uh, he was taken into a squad car, he was then ultimately hospitalized, where he had to be physically restrained by hospital staff. And so it would be our intention to provide the court with all of those additional records just simply as a supplemental offer of proof in that regard. And you can make that offer of proof by filing those, but the question I have for you, and this is so you don't have to speculate as to the court's ruling, what 404B exception does all this go to? What does it establish that is an element of the crime here? Well, it, it establishes a modus operandi, essentially, of Mr. Floyd, and that and when Mr. Floyd is apprehended, or at least in one prior incident, 
when he was arrested by the Minneapolis Police Department, did the exact same thing that he did here. And when we get into the question of his cause of death, um, is he actively ingesting narcotics that would potentially cause his death? Well, does it really go to that, though? I'm, and I'm asking this, uh, you know the file better. It could have been. I don't think the state's uh, contesting the fact that fentanyl and methamphetamine were found in Mr. Floyd's blood after his death. Is that correct, Mr. Frank? And the the amounts, I think, are what Dr. Baker is going to talk about. Why does it matter that he took it in response to police action, that is, the police coming up to his car, versus maybe 15 minutes before or an hour before? Sure. The bottom line is they're drugs, they're in his system, unless he's claiming, unless you're claiming uh, or the state's claiming that someone... Uh, so involuntarily you, intoxicated him by, by essentially forcing drugs on. It just I, I don't see how it establishes. Because your honor, and, and perhaps this is the missing component, because ultimately what is being said a lot about this particular case is is that the Minneapolis police overreacted to a twenty dollar counterfeit bill, but what people in our line of work, whether it be the court, the defense, police, the state. We understand that these are fluid situations that often evolve. Maybe an initial very minor, minor report, but when the police go to intervene and suddenly you learn that there are drugs in the car or guns in the car, I'm not suggesting there were guns in the car here, because there weren't. I'm just using this as a general example. Or there are warrants for someone's arrest. Um, you, you, these are evolving situations that call into question the amount of force that police are authorized to use. And so it, it's, a, it's a lot different if you're, trying to, um, if you're trying to conceal or secrete controlled substances than it is, you know, a $20 bill. This isn't just a $20 bill. And it, it ultimately goes to the very nature of the police response. Well, and... As I understood it at our September motion hearing, there is not an assertion by the defense that Mr. Chauvin knew or had arrested Mr. Floyd on, as part of that May 16th, 2019 incident. Correct. Um, but but then, if, if, you look at, if you look at the 2019 response, right, the Minneapolis police pull him over. He, the officer draws his firearm immediately because Mr. Floyd is not showing his hands. And I know that in this particular case, Officer Lane did that exact same thing. It goes to the measure of the police response to that particular situation. So if, if we're going to come in here and we're going to have experts from Los Angeles and Montana and wherever else they're coming in from to say this was an unauthorized use of force and you have a prior incident where officers used an identical use of force in an almost identical situation, uh, that's where it becomes relevant. Well, you can make your offer proof. We can revisit it later, but uh, I, I'll be honest, I'm not convinced. I could see where that evidence might be proper if you had said, Mr. Chauvin was part of that arrest or knew about that arrest, and therefore when he uh, had the contact with uh, Mr. Floyd that resulted in his death, I could see where it'd be like, oh, this is what he does. I have knowledge that this is how George Floyd reacts to police interaction. But it doesn't establish that because Mr. Chauvin wasn't a part of that arrest. Understood, Your Honor. It's more of a generic, let's pick a... A situation because we have a body worn camera and Mr. Floyd on it, there could be other body worn cameras that show that that's not how the police react to it. So I guess I'm telling you right now, I'm not convinced yet uh, to reverse my ruling, but I'll consider whatever you have as far as written offer proof. Thank you, Judge. All right. Thank now, you. in conclusion on this issue, as you just heard, Judge Cashel didn't reject the admissibility of the drug ingestion evidence outright. 
He left the door open for the defense to file a more detailed motion, making their argument for admissibility of that evidence, but he clearly was not favorably disposed to the argument, at least in the moment. Now, most of the other motions in limine discussed today were settled without objection, meaning the state and defense came to an agreement between themselves, and the judge simply noted that the issue captured by that motion had been resolved by the parties. Uh, Many of these were simply matters of evidentiary discovery and sharing between the state and defense. A few of the motions, like that involving Floyd's prior arrest-related drug ingestion, were reserved by the court, meaning in effect that they are still in play and not yet resolved by the court at this time. After the motions discussion was wrapped up for the day, there was some entirely separate progress made on the jury selection front, despite the jury pool having been dismissed almost as soon as they'd arrived at the courthouse this morning, specifically based on individual juror responses to the 14-page juror questionnaire, which we did embed in this morning's post on the trial, by the way. You can find it there. Uh, The state prosecutors and the defense team had reviewed those questionnaires for the first 50 pool juries, and they were able to agree to dismiss 16 of the first 50 pooled jurors for cause. Now, dismissing a prospective juror for cause doesn't mean the jurors done anything wrong. It just means that there's a good reason for them not to serve on the jury. This cause could be some relationship a juror has with one of the parties involved in the case. It could be a home responsibility that could not be met consistent with the duties of serving on a jury in a multi-week murder trial or any other number of perfectly good reasons uh, for that juror to be dismissed. When the state and defense can agree that a prospective juror can be dismissed for cause, then obviously there's no argument between the parties with respect to that prospective juror, and they're simply dismissed from the case. More difficult are instances in which one party wants a prospective juror removed for cause, And the other party objects, perhaps because the other party would strongly prefer to have that person serve on the jury for strategic reasons. In the case of such disagreement, the parties can each make their arguments for cause and against cause before the judge, and the judge will determine whether cause exists to dismiss the prospective juror. If so, the prospective juror is dismissed. If the judge fails to find cause for dismissal, however, there's another way, the party that wants the prospective juror dismissed to get them off the trial, and that's by using one of their peremptory strikes. Each party in a criminal trial has a limited number of peremptory strikes they can use to dismiss a prospective juror without having to make a four-cause argument. Normally, in Minnesota criminal cases, the defense is granted five peremptory strikes and the state is granted three peremptory strikes. In this high-profile case, and amidst concerns about possible difficulty in drawing the necessary 12 jurors and two alternates into an unbiased panel, Judge Cashel has tripled the number of peremptory strikes to 15 for the defense and nine for the state. Well, with that jury dismissal for cause being out of the way, the court recessed for the day. So trial proceedings are scheduled to begin again tomorrow at 8 a.m. Central Time with the state and defense meeting again with Judge Cashel to discuss any still open motions that need to be resolved. Then the jury pool is scheduled to report to the courthouse at 8.30 a.m. with jury selection scheduled to begin at 9 a.m. And we will be there for you all day. Of course, that whole jury selection process could still be brought to a screeching halt, as it was today. Uh, It could be brought to a halt tomorrow at the instruction of the Minnesota Court of Appeals uh, for reasons we discussed in some detail in the earlier blog post today on the trial proceedings. Uh, But we won't know that until that happens tomorrow or doesn't happen tomorrow. Okay, folks, that's all I have for all of you today. Until I see you tomorrow with our continuing live coverage of this trial, stay safe. I'm attorney Andrew Branker for Law of Self-Defense and as a guest for Legal Insurrection. Take care. 